For those of you who don't know, I'm uh, James Dobbinspeck from the University of Alabama at Birmingham in Birmingham, Alabama. And like John told you, I'm going to talk to you a little bit of today about moonlighting proteins. Now, when this was first, this phenomenon was first discovered in the late 80s, it was initially called gene sharing. But as many of the geneticists here will tell you, that term is already taken in that field. So in 1999, this uh, term moonlighting protein was coined. Um, this phenomenon is really just a protein will have multiple functions. And this is true in every species from humans all the way to mycoides. Um, James, you might explain for those of us who are not familiar with the term, like a, a job where you're moonlighting, what moonlighting means. <laughs> well, in the old days, it meant you would uh, work your regular job and then uh, moonlight or go work a second job. Um, <laughs> I guess that is an older term. Uh, it really means having more than one job, and that's what it's, I think it's always meant. Now, there's several ways that this can occur in uh, organisms. Um, the two that I'm going to talk about today are the cell surface, the change in location, so it goes from the cytoplasma to the membrane, and the change in oligomeric state, where it goes from a tetramer to a trimer. And this example that I'm going to use is uh, a favorite protein of mine called enolase. And um, it is very highly conserved uh, in all organisms. Um, and I, I'll give you an example in a little bit. Now, this initially starts in Mycoplasma pulmonis. Um, the PLD is the phospholipase D. And I'll get into more exactly what this enzyme does in the future. But basically, it cleaves proteins off of a surface if they're in a specific linkage. Um, if we look at the initial one, the Kamasi, and this is of the enolase band, and that's what's labeled here. Um, we have a Kamasi, the glycostain, you can see it lights up. The phosphostain lights up. The Western and the IP were all done. This is how highly conserved this enzyme is across species. The IP and Western were done with antibodies that were generated against human enolase. So it's that highly conserved. If we look at the species of, of the protein enolase in the membrane, we can see that it lights up with Kamasi, and this will be seen in panel C. We can see it lights up with Kamasi, glyco, and phospho, where the enzyme in the cytoplasm only lights up in Kamasi. You don't see any staining in the glycosylation or in phosphorylation, okay? So this is a gas chroma uh, chromatograms of the implomonas excised enolase, right? So this was uh, IP purified membrane enolase and IP purified membrane enolase that was treated with phospholipase D, okay? The very top panel is a Ramno standard and that's just commercially available, okay? But in gas chromatography, the sugar, the shapes of the peaks for each individual sugar are a, a constant. So that ratio that we see in the standard of one large peak and one small peak and the other two peaks is carried over into any chromatogram that has Ramnos, okay? So in the IP purified membrane enolase, we can see the Ramnos peak shifts to the right. And this is indicative of a phosphate that's linked to the molecule and just, it doesn't change the shape of the sugar. It just changes the uh, mobility over time, all right? You can also see the lipid peak come up in this chromatogram, and that's a very easy signature to read in the MSMS of this, which is not shown, by the way. But it, what you see is breaks of 14 Daltons, right, with that CH2 coming off every time. In the third panel, we'll see the IP purified membranes that's been treated with uh, phospholipase D, and you can see the Ramnos returns, and we lose a large part of the lipid signal. Okay ahead and this is all from published work but we went ahead and identified the site on the protein that in pulmonis the enolase protein in pulmonis and it's the glutamine at 437 okay this is a representation of the uh, ramnophospholipid that links enolase to the surface of the pulmonis membrane 
and it shows the PLD cleavage side. And this is really just a hydrolase. So it just adds the water at that bond. Your sugar returns to a hydroxyl and the phosphate retains the oxygen. And so this is the, now that was the translocation part of the story, right? The, mem the enzyme goes from the cytoplasm to the membrane and changes function when it does that. The, this is just a structural representation. This one happens to be from a, another bacterial species. Um, but this is what happens in, ba in, in, in bacterial systems. In the cytoplasm, in the penultimate step of uh, glycolysis, enolase is an, an octamer. Right. So eight um, proteins form up this machinery, and that is what forms the active site for the step in glycolysis. Now, this remosylation event occurs at this glutamine 437, which is at the dimerization interface. And when this remosylation event occurs, and we don't really understand a lot about what happens after that step, that enzyme or that protein can no longer form an octamer, and at that point is translated, uh, uh, transported to the surface of the, pro uh, the bacteria, right, and attached to the membrane via that ramnophospholipid linker. Right. Now I've looked at the parent parental strain GM12, and um, the difference really between the two uh, bacteria is that. In pulmonis, it's a monosaccharide, and in GM12, it's a diramnose or a disaccharide, right? And this shows the PLD cleavage side, and really what I just wanted to show is how difficult it is, because the R is where the protein is. The only thing that's sticking up are those two ramnoses above this um, lipid bilayer, right? So you can see how closely it's tied to the membrane and then the protein extends from the R. All right. So I'm starting to do these experiments in um, synth. And this is really this one of the initial experiments. This is treated with phospholipase D or heat kill phospholipase D, All right? And here I show enolase and the now these were just grown normally and then treated uh, and analyzed by Page, but there's been quite a bit of difficulty with working with synth, um, especially the washing step. We tend to get a lot of self lysis um, when we handle this organism after harvesting, and that's what leads to most of this uh, material showing up in the heat kill lane. You can see the difference in concentration by eye, but when we do the uh, measurements, it actually turns out to be a threefold, about a threefold increase over the heat kill PLD. Okay. So a graduate student in our lab, John Sanford, is going to tell you a lot more about this particular part of it here in a second. But there's a system in uh, mycoplasmas that hexosylates proteins on the exterior of the bacteria. And this has been shown in pulmonis, arthritis. Um, we're currently working on showing it in pneumonia and genitalium and scent. Um, we've identified a number of proteins that are hexosylated um, on the synth 3A. Um, this is just a sampling of some that are known moonlighting enzymes, uh, moonlighting proteins in other organisms. Um, so we got CTP synthase, EFTU, lactate dehydrogenase. Um, like I said, all of these are known moonlighting proteins in other systems, modified by with a hexose that only occurs on the outside of the bacterial cell, which means these proteins have to be occurring on the surface of the SYN3A. Now, Um, our data suggests that this system is active in JCVI sin 3 a which is not really surprising. The more I've worked with this system over the years, it's become quite apparent that it is essential in almost everything. Um, now, if that former statement is true, then the sin 3 a functionome, 
just expanded by about 50 percent. So 452 proteins become 678 functions. And um, Kevin, when I was talking to him yesterday, he asked me about this number, the 50 percent number. Um, how confident I was in that number. And I replied to him that it was a very conservative number, and then I got to thinking about it, of course. And I think this number is true in M. pulmonis and M. arthritis, where we've looked at this system, and that's based on the number of recovered peptides and other data. Um, I think in minimal organisms like M. genitalium, which is a native or a natural minimal organism, Right, it's the mycoplasma genitalium is the closest thing we have to scent from nature. Um, the percentage of proteins that have a secondary or tertiary function in uh, mycoplasma genitalium, I think, is up over eighty percent, and I think that may be the case in scent three A two. Um, now I know this complicates, and I'll apologize in advance to the modelers in the community because it will certainly complicate your model. Um, questions of sensuality, they become way more complex. Um, is it the primary, secondary, or tertiary function that's essential, right? So and if you have any questions about why a particular enzyme is essential and you can't really figure it out, you might be able to go back and ask, is there a secondary or another function that's affecting essentiality? It also complicates the questions of design and, and designing pathways. Because every time you add a protein, you add multiple functions that at this point in time, we are not able to predict. Now, <laughs> in future directions, of course, over the next couple of months, I'm gonna finish this analysis of the moonlighting system. We're gonna do experiments very similar to what I've shown you for pulmonis. Um, including some um, flow experiments to show that these enzymes are on the surface of the cell. Um, I'd like to identify the enzymes responsible for the synthesis of rhamnose and that phospholipid. And I'd like to identify the mechanism of the trans, uh, transport mechanism to uh, move the protein or the enzyme from the cytoplasm to the surface. So I'll acknowledge everybody. Um, and be more than happy to take any questions. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. So um, because our lab works with lipids and membranes, um, I'm familiar with PLD and also interested in it. Mm -hmm. And it's really neat to show that it's active on the surface of the cell. Um, and you suggest that part of this is because the sugars are actually sticking out of the membrane. So yes. are you looking at, or do you have any insights into PLA1 or PLA2 activity in SYN3? Uh, because of course, cleaving acyl chains, you have to actually get into the bilayer. Right. That's a very difficult, and it, we've tried PLC, um, PLC, so phospholipase C, uh, and it didn't work. Um, but PLC is still head group. Well, it's the it's below the phosphate, not above the phosphate, right? Right. And that makes it down in the down in the lipid bilayer, and the enzyme can't access it, at least in a whole cell format. If you take it out of that format and suspend the protein in the solution, uh, I think the enzymes will work then. Yeah, I ask because we have firm evidence of uh, PLA one and PLA two activity in Syn three. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course, so I just wanted to confirm that you think that, that wouldn't be active at the membrane that would have to be happening somewhere else. And then you need something to then get the modified lipid into the membrane. That's exactly what I think. I, I think you'd have okay. difficulty making that reaction work in, um, with the whole cell. Okay. But that, if, the, if we're correct on the molecule and what it looks like, then it should work in solution, no problem. Great. Thank you. James, do you have candidate genes for the different phospholipase activities? Uh, no, sir, I do not. I would love to have some. I have um, one or two. 
they're hypothetical at this point, but there's evidence for them. Really? And James, this is Isaac Justice in James Sands's lab. Isaac, I appreciate you very much if you would uh, email me those. Yeah. If you don't absolutely. mind. Absolutely. Not at all. I'd be happy. And to like talk I said, if you have any if, if, if you have any questions or anything about these kinds of reactions, I'm more than happy to talk to you. Fantastic. I'll definitely follow up. Thank you. And James and Isaac, if these candidates happen to be non-essential or quasi-essential, we can think about taking them out. So we've already, we have a shipment that we're waiting on. And some of these candidates, we're hoping to answer that question with that shipment because some are quasi-essential. We've also talked with David Bianchi and Dame, James Peltier, um, mm -hmm. sort of theorizing about what these genes might be as well. So there are some ideas and hopefully things will be coming our way that will allow us to answer these questions. So we have some thoughts. Isaac, I need a list of everything you want me to send, and we will get it out as soon as you're ready. We should have already given you that, but I'm very happy to reset well, it as it, soon as possible. But it's if if you have any new thoughts, now's the now's the time. <laughs> I'll double check with my team, but I think we're ready to go. Okay, um, James Dalton specs. So you're still suggesting that there are there is a phospholipase D floating around on the surface of of the minimal cell? No, that's not not at all. The phospholipase D is, uh, we purchased Fisher. OK, um, sure, sure. Um, but a phospholipase on the surface? Um, I don't think so. OK. I, really don't. I think so, it's- so, I'm sorry. And then what's putting the rhamnos, is the rhamnos, uh, installed in the cytoplasm, or is it happen extra, you know, on the surface? Right. The rhamnos is installed in the cytoplasm. Okay. And that blocks dimeriz at least in enolase, it blocks dimerization of the octamer. Now, I thought we had had a discussion once that ram that the minimal cell didn't use rhamnos. Well, I didn't touch on it here, John, but in synth one, it uses instead of rhamnos, it uses mannose. Okay. So I think it mannose is involved in the pathway to synthesize rhamnose in mycoplasmas. Got it. That's another different story for another day. That's a rhamnose is one of those synthetic pathways that's very well understood in E. coli and Subtilis. There's a mm -hmm. set of four genes, RML genes, mm -hmm. RML A through D. Mycoplasmas do not have that, but every mycoplasma I've tested has rhamnose. And so the question would be is if we take the mycoplasmas that are grown in um, fully defined media that doesn't have any rhamnos, are you still going to find any rhamnos? Yes, absolutely. What I've would you think? I've checked myself, so I know. I've checked every every component of SP4 that we use in our lab for rhamnos before I grew um, bacteria in it and then found rhamnos at the end of that. So somehow you think that Sen3A makes rhamnos from what? GM12 makes rhamnos. Um, okay. Sen1 does not. All right. So there are not many things missing between GM12. Well, but that's a, that's a talk for another day. Yes. Uh, um, I would love to find that enzyme. I really would. We'll 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 talk soon. I I I have no plans to go to Birmingham, but I had a chat with you guys.